Welcome to the CFA Colloquium. Uh, my name is Sandro Takela. I'm a postdoc here at the CFA and I will be the host today. So I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker, Professor Christy Tremonti from University of Wisconsin Medicine. She did her PhD back in 2003 at Johns Hopkins University and then was a Humboldt Fellow at MPIA in, in Heidelberg in Germany and then a Hubble Fellow at the University of Arizona before then joining the faculty at University of Wisconsin. So Christy is a leader in the field of galaxy evolution. Her research interests include um, star formation and chemical evolution in galaxies, HGN feedback and galactic winds. She's an observational astronomer working mainly with spectroscopy from the UV to infrared wavelengths. And she has done several groundbreaking, groundbreaking studies um, related to local and high redshift galaxies. Her seminal work based on the origin of the mass metallicity relation is one of the most cited works in the field of galaxy evolution. And throughout her career, she has received a large number of grants and awards, including the NSF Career Grant and the HI Romness Faculty Fellowship. So I think we are uh, very fortunate today to hear from her about probing star formation and feedback at its most extreme. So thank you and Christy, please take it away. So thank you for that nice introduction. And thanks to everyone, you know, if you're coming out today and, uh, you know, putting aside your NSF proposals and your JWST proposals, uh, I appreciate that. All right, so today we're gonna talk about star formation and feedback at its um, most extreme. But before I dive in, I just wanted to highlight my, um, you know, cosmic web of collaborators. I think these days it's hard to be a good astronomer in isolation. And um, you know, uh, my colleagues and collaborators have played a huge part in the work I'm gonna show you. And I'll try to call out some individual faces as we go forward. All right, so our topic today is gonna be feedback and implicit in that is the idea that we're gonna be talking about negative feedback. So um, the idea is that uh, feedback refers to this process by which stars and possibly black holes are returning energy to their surrounding interstellar gas and thereby inhibiting future star formation or future black hole growth. And we can see a beautiful kind of local example of this here where we see this young massive star cluster forming and you really get the sense of that cluster pushing back against all its you know natal material that it formed from. Um, we're going to primarily think about the collective effects of feedback on larger scales, and in particular, when galaxies have high star formation rates, um, very often these processes can work to actually drive gas and dust out of galaxies. And we see that in this beautiful example of um, a nearby starburst galaxy M82. We're seeing the disk edge on here. And in H alpha, we see this beautiful biconical outflow of gas and dust. And these outflows can, you know, carry up to 10 or, you know, one or 10 times the mass um, of gas that's locked up into stars. So they can have a lot of cosmic consequences, as we'll see. So just to give you a feel for where we're going, we're going to talk about, you know, why star formation feedback is important, um, why it's particularly challenging to study. And then we're going to think about what we can learn by studying the universe's most extreme examples. Um, how they can help us better understand galaxy scaling relationships. And finally, you know, how we can actually accelerate cool gas to super high velocities. All right, so to answer this question of why feedback is important, we're largely going to turn to cosmological simulations because there we have the advantage of being able to, you know, flip a switch and turn feedback on and turn feedback off. And that's what you see here. This um, image is from some work by Dylan Nelson, and we can see the gas density, the temperature, and the velocity. And there's nothing in particular you need to take away from this other than, you know, the universe looks different when we don't have feedback. And we'll kind of unpack um, some of the ways in which it's different. So primarily, you know, the big effect of feedback is it, you know, regulates and slows down star formation. So this is a nice example from some work a few years ago, looking at the star formation histories of four different types of galaxies. Um, this is work by Phil Hopkins. And we can see for this high redshift galaxy uh, with feedback, you know, without feedback, star formation peaks super early and then declines quickly. Whereas feedback um, allows that process to happen um, more gradually over cosmic time. 
When we put this all together and look at the star formation history of the universe, we can see profound differences when feedback's included in simulations and when it's not. When there's no feedback, um, the star formation history of the universe is so extreme that it goes right off the plot. We can see that when we include feedback from just star formation, we do a pretty good job, that's this green line, of matching the observations, which are shown in gray. Um, and at late times, it becomes important to also include feedback from black holes. Now, my talk is going to concentrate almost exclusively on star formation feedback, but we know, of course, that black hole feedback is very important as well. All right. Feedback is also critical in setting the relationship between a galaxy's dark matter halo mass and its stellar mass. So here, as a function of dark matter mass, we're seeing that um, stellar mass to dark matter mass ratio. And the gray here shows observational data. And then these points come from a variety of different simulations. The blue one is where feedback has not been included. And you can see that without feedback, this ratio is pretty close to the cosmic average of you know, baryonic matter to total matter. Um, when feedback is included, you know, it seems to be absolutely essential to include it in order to match those observations and different kinds of feedback um, can get you, you know, closer to that relationship. Feedback is also critical in setting the morphology of galaxies. Of course, if we don't have feedback, star formation happens early and then when galaxies merge, you know, they, they undergo dry mergers and they produce, you know, kinematically hot remnants that tend to be more bulge dominated. Um, you know, when feedback is included and there are different ways it can be included, we can reproduce thin disks. Finally, nearest and dearest to my heart, um, feedback is absolutely critical in removing gas and metals from galaxy disks and helping us establish this mass metallicity relation, you know, which we know exists over some six decades in stellar mass. Um, it's also critical in taking those metals and moving them out to larger radii. So this is some work um, done with illustrious TMG, exploring the gas metallicity on larger scales. And this radius here is half the burial radius. So we can see those metals being moved out of galaxies in these galactic winds into the circumgalactic medium. Okay. So to this audience, you know, I realize I'm probably preaching to the crier when talking about how important feedback is. Um, you know, we just know it influences galaxy star formation rates, their stellar masses, their morphologies, the chemistry of the gas in galaxies and outside of it. It's just one of the profoundly important properties or processes in galaxy evolution. Um, despite its importance, it has been, you know, really challenging to study both observationally and theoretically. And part of the reason for that is that it results from a multitude of different processes that are all ultimately linked to massive stars. So supernova produce, you know, hot gaseous bubbles that, you know, will expand and sweep up gas. That's the basic engine of feedback. But there are also big contributions from stellar winds, um, which also can produce hot gas when they shock with the surrounding interstellar medium. We can also have radiation pressure on dust grains. These hot, young, massive stars produce a lot of UV photons that can be absorbed by dust and can transport momentum that way. Photoionization heating turns out to be important. And in the last few years, there's been a lot of work on trying to incorporate the effect of cosmic rays, which can act on very different spatial scales than some of these other processes. Um, so again, here's a nice example of a star cluster pushing back on its surrounding gas and dust, um, but it's due to a variety of processes. The other thing that's really challenging about this is that um, it produces very highly structured kind of multi-phase gas. So I'm going to uh, show you this simulation here, which is um, part of the Tigris simulations done by Changu Kim and Eve Ostriker. And what we're looking at here are star clusters forming in an edge on disk. So each little dot here is a star cluster that's formed and the colored dots are the young clusters. And we're looking at maps of density, temperature, pressure, velocity, and um, the magnetic field strength. And so what you see in this small scale simulation that's able to kind of self consistently follow the star formation process and the structure of the interstellar medium 
you see that you know it's very complicated, highly structured, and there are a lot of different co-spatial gas phases. Um, this has made feedback really, really tough to simulate where, you know, cosmological simulations just simply cannot resolve these scales. And so it's led to the need to incorporate these kind of subgrid prescriptions to handle, um, you know, these physical processes that are below the resolution limit. Um, observationally, it's been, you know, challenging too, because often we can only observe one of these gas phases and we kind of have to extrapolate to understand the full picture. All right, well, how do we learn about feedback? Um, you know, one good way to learn about it is by implementing different feedback prescriptions in simulations and seeing which ones best match the observational data like we saw in this plot previously. But it turns out that, you know, this is a really indirect way to do it, right? Because there's so many other things that can be important in reproducing these correlations. Um, you know, what is the star formation efficiency? We have to think about how gas gets into galaxies, um, the role of mergers, many different processes. So I'm going to argue that the most direct way to study feedback, the best way to study it, is to look at its most um, dramatic manifestations, which are these bipolar galactic winds. So here's yet another picture of M82. We'll see this galaxy a couple more times in this talk. Um, and again, we're looking at the disk edge on and the um, red stuff here is actually showing dust in this image. It's a Spitzer image showing dust being blown out of the galaxy. And the blue stuff here is um, x-rays showing that you know, hot uh, gas being produced by supernova and stellar winds. All right, so we're gonna talk about extremes today. And um, I will argue that 2020 has been a year of extremes. Um, mostly, you know, in our life, extremes are, are, you know, we think of extremes as being bad. And certainly they have been this year. And I think we're all pretty ready to move on from those extremes. Um, but I'm going to hope to, to uh, tell you about some extremes that can be good. We're going to look at extremes in terms of galaxy star formation rates and um, other physical properties. And in, in fact, extreme outflows. And so one question is, you know, why it's useful to go to extremes like this. And I'm going to show you that it's useful to kind of extend the dynamic range of these kind of fundamental correlations in galaxy physical properties. So things like the mass metallicity relation, you know, took years to uncover because most individual studies looked at samples that had a small dynamic range. And it wasn't until we had SDSS that allowed us to look over several orders of magnitude in stellar mass where we could start to see this fundamental trend imprinted on the galaxy population. So by looking at the most extreme galaxies, we can extend the dynamic range of trends. The other reason is that it's really interesting to probe the physics of what's possible by looking at the most extreme examples of phenomena that we can find. All right. So just to convince you that um, we are going to be looking at some extreme galaxies, here is yet another image of M82. And again, the pink stuff is the outflow highlighted in H alpha. And I'm contrasting this with um, an image of one of the galaxies in the sample that I'm going to talk about, one of our extreme starbursts. And here, what you're seeing in grayscale is an HST image that's been, this galaxy is at redshift a half or so. Um, this HST image has been stretched really hard, so you can see some of the fainter tidal features. This galaxy is a little bit, um, a, a little merger. And what you're looking at in color is a narrow band O2 image made from the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. So it's an IFU spectrograph. And we've just picked out a slice around O2 3727. So it should be pretty comparable to what we could see if we were looking at H alpha similar to M82. Now in M82, the outflow um, doesn't extend to radii that are much larger than the radii of the disk. Uh, if we had a deeper image, we could see it, you know, it might go up almost twice what you see here, um, but it doesn't extend more than about 10 kiloparsecs. The O2 gas that we're seeing around Makani, and I'll show you later that this gas is part of an outflow, so this is outflowing gas at all radii, um, extends up to about 50 kiloparsecs. So it really is an extreme outflow compared to M82 in the local universe. 
So we'll talk about this galaxy a little bit later, but let me tell you a little bit more about our sample in general. All right, so we're going to be talking about a sample of 50 galaxies that are part of what we call the Hisea sample. And I'll tell you where that name comes from in a minute. Uh, these galaxies were selected from the Sloan One survey. I actually found them sort of by eye as a graduate student flipping through spectra. That was the, the beginning of all this. Um, and these galaxies are actually, you know, targeted as quasars in the SDSS, but they turn out not to be. So they're at redshifts of 0.4 to 0.8, and they turn out to be very massive and uh, to have, you know, high star formation rates of a few hundred solar masses a year. If we were to put them on the color magnitude diagram in SDSS1, they'd be where this green circle is. They're really extreme outliers. But again, most Sloan galaxies are at redshifts of 0.1, and we're looking at sort of redshift to half to 0.8. If we put them on this deep two color magnitude diagram, however, we still see that they sit in, you know, an interesting part of a parameter space. They tend to be more luminous and bluer than your average galaxy. Um, Sloan, of course, covers an enormous volume, so I think we really have picked out some of the extreme galaxies in the universe. All right, well, where's this funny name come from? Well, it was my shorthand for high redshift E plus A. Because when we selected these galaxies, we really only applied two criterion. We looked for things that were in that redshift range, and we looked for things that were blue but had weak emission lines. And I did this at the time because I was interested in studying the shutoff of star formation, and I wanted to select post-starburst galaxies. So you can see some of their spectra here. They are indeed very blue, and they indeed have very weak nebular emission lines. So that's O2, and we see H beta over here. Um, it turns out a few years later, they were observed by WISE. And when we look at their SEDs, um, most of them have quite strong far infrared SCDs insofar as we're able to measure it. And you can see that over here. These are some of the WISE points. Um, so it turns out most of these, you know, despite our cut on nebular emission lines, um, do have quite a bit of ongoing star formation. So they are not post-starburst. In fact, many of them have star formation rates of you know, several hundred or close to a thousand solar masses a year. All right, well, in SDSS-1, these galaxies were super boring. They're just you know, little unresolved dots, but that's no surprise that you know, redshift to half galaxies should look unresolved in ground-based imaging. So we followed up a subset of galaxies with Hubble and you know these redshifts are kind of Hubble's bread and butter. We should see you know little blurry smudges in ground-based images resolved into nice disk galaxies. Um, but that's in fact not what we saw. <laughs> um, it was quite a surprise when we got this imaging. So it turns out this is a redshift to half galaxy here. But the galaxy that we're interested in is this little blue dot. And with Hubble, it looks like a star. In fact, if you look closely. You can see these little, you know, this little ring of dots around it. You're seeing the airy ring of the PSF. So even with Hubble, these galaxies looked, you know, stellar in many cases. Now it turns out that they are not, you know, uniformly stellar. So this is some nice work from my former graduate student Paul Sell. Um, every single one of them showed a very, very compact core. And when I say compact, I mean you know, 100 to 200 parsecs. So very compact, considering that these are very massive, 10 to the, you know, 10 to 10 to the 11 solar mass galaxies. Um, many of these galaxies showed that compact core. You can see the airy rings, again, just emphasizing just how compact it is. But many of them also showed tidal features indicative of major merging. So we think these galaxies are the products of some kind of very highly dissipational major merger. So some very gas rich major merger where a bunch of gas got concentrated in the center and it had a very compact starburst. That galaxy that I showed you before, Makani, um, Makani's uh, Hawaiian for wind, that one was special enough, we gave it a name, but here it is and you can see it also has that very compact core as well as some tidal features. Okay, so these galaxies at redshift a half are kind of the freaks of nature, right? They're like, you know, bluer, they're brighter, they're more compact than anything we see at redshift a half. Um, 
but I think they are probably fairly typical examples of a phenomena that happened at redshifts two to four. Um, that is the formation of um, the progenitors of massive elliptical galaxies today. So we think those galaxies, you know, started their star formation relatively early, probably had a dust enshrouded starburst. Um, you know, the prevailing theory for these compact massive galaxies is that a quasar cleared away the gas and dust, leaving behind a compact remnant that we see at redshifts two to four. And then that remnant was fluffed up by um, minor merging to produce the larger ellipticals that we see today. Um, so we think our galaxies are probably good analogs for this process happening at slightly lower redshifts. Whether or not we need this quasar phase is something you know, that I think is a, an open question for as far as we're concerned. OK, so just to show you that these galaxies are, in fact, really compact, this is a nice plot from some recent work by Alex Diamond Stanick that's just been submitted. Um, comparing the sizes and masses of these galaxies to other samples. So this is stellar mass on the x-axis and effective radius on the y-axis here. And this um, red line here shows the size mass relation that we would expect these galaxies to be on given their redshifts. Um, the data are down here. This, the stars here show if we just consider the size mass relation of the central part of the galaxy, if we look at the whole galaxy, this is what we see. Um, and the redshift two and a half to three compact starbursts um, from Van Dokum and collaborators are, are shown here. Um, it turns out the uh, samples at high redshift probably weren't sensitive to galaxies quite as compact as ours just because of the resolution limits of um, HST. So maybe with JWST, we'll find some galaxies that are as compact as these. I think the other thing going on here is that because our galaxies are still young, um, they're more dominated by their sort of central bright core than uh, older galaxies would be. All right. So given how compact the galaxies are, they have really extraordinary star formation surface densities. So this is also some work from Alex Diamond Stanick uh, that's a little bit older, where he looked at, um, this is a plot of stellar mass versus star formation surface density. And star forming galaxies at redshift one live where these contours are. And our galaxies are shown as these black points. And the interesting thing is they have such high star formation surface densities that they might be consistent with being kind of Eddington limited starbursts. So perhaps limited by their own radiation pressure. All right, so we think these galaxies are extreme. Now let's take a look at their outflow properties and see if they are also um, comparably extreme. So the way we do that is by using the magnesium two interstellar medium absorption line. So these black lines are, are spectra. So you know, in Sloan, we couldn't tell anything about the outflows of these galaxies. The spectra were far too noisy. So we followed them up. And the black lines show some of our spectra. The red lines show stellar population model fits to the spectra. Um, and the models you know, generally fit well. And we can see this um, excess absorption feature here in the blue. And that's coming from interstellar magnesium two. Magnesium-2 has an ionization potential of about 15 eV, so it traces kind of that warm, cool phase of the gas. And since we're looking at absorption against the starburst itself, the starburst is our backlight, we would only expect to see gas between us and the starburst, so we should see that stuff being blue shifted if it's in an outflow. All right, so I'm just zooming in on our spectra now and we're highlighting this region around magnesium two. And magnesium two is a doublet. So you know, normally there, there are two absorption features. Um, in our galaxies, uh, so I'm zooming in on magnesium two and I'm showing velocity on the x-axis here. Um, I've used the bluer member of the doublet to show the velocities. So you can kind of believe these velocities for the bluer member of the doublet. And you can see that the velocities are pretty extreme. In some cases, we see velocities as large as, you know, minus 2,500 kilometers per second. And sometimes there's no gas at zero velocity. We're seeing a little bit of P-signy emission at zero velocity um, and no absorption. So that's pretty unusual. And we'll kind of quantify these velocities in a minute. 
Okay, so we're going to look at um, some scaling relations. And some nice work on this was done by my thesis student, John Chisholm, who just started a faculty job at the University of Texas in Austin. And he looked at a sample of local, you know, primarily starburst galaxies, because in the local universe, if you want to drive winds, it probably takes a starburst. And what he found was that there were some nice correlations between outflow velocity. So we're looking at outflow velocity on the y-axis and stellar mass and star formation rate on the x-axis. And you know, this work builds on some work done by Crystal Martin and David Rupke um, showing these correlations as well. But um, it was a nice chance to take a look at some of these in a little bit more detail with a really high quality data set. So he found that outflow velocity correlates with both of them, star formation rate and stellar mass. But it was really hard to tell you know, what was the more fundamental trend. They're both kind of equally well correlated. And within the sample that he studied, there wasn't enough dynamic range to really try to tease apart these different correlations. So we couldn't really you know, look at star formation at fixed stellar mass because those two properties were correlated. All right, um, so I'll show you some similar plots now from the Hysaia sample. And this is the work of Julie Davis, who's a thesis student of mine. And this is all you know, very much work in progress. Um, so we're looking at the same type of plot now where we have stellar mass on the x-axis and outflow velocity on the y-axis. And for comparison, I'm showing two samples from the literature, one of which is John Chisholm's sample that I just showed you. So his sample is shown as black points. I'm also showing Kate Rubin's sample, which used magnesium-2 um, at redshift of about a half. And this sample was largely drawn from the deep two galaxies. So you can see there's you know, pretty reasonable agreement between John Chisholm's local sample and Kate's sample at redshift a half. But when we look at the Hysaia galaxies, they are you know, huge outliers from the trend established by the local sample. And we can see that we have velocities ranging from you know, 500 all the way up to about 3,000 kilometers per second. All right, so the first thing you're probably thinking is, hey, wait a minute, isn't that just AGN feedback? You know, why not? And in fact, that's what I thought too. I published a paper, we think with that in the title, but it turns out that I was wrong. Um, we've spent you know, a decade kind of investigating these galaxies. And you know, when we saw they were very compact, we thought, oh, well, you know, maybe what we're seeing is a type 1 AGN. But we can really rule that out because we just don't see the broad emission lines you'd expect from H beta and magnesium 2. So here's a spectrum of one of our galaxies. And the green line is a fit to that spectrum where we're only including you know, stellar population templates. The pink line is another fit where I've mixed in a 60% you know, AGN contribution. And it's really hard to hide that AGN without producing some kind of broad emission lines. Um, so we don't see broad lines except for one galaxy, which turns out to have, I think, the second lowest outflow velocity in our sample. So these galaxies probably have AGN, but I just don't think they're very bolometrically dominant. Um, we followed the galaxies up in x-rays. We largely got non-detections. A couple of galaxies had a couple of counts, but it would be perfectly consistent with their high star formation rates. Their mid-infrared colors are also kind of consistent with star formation. And when we look at their BPT diagrams, looking at you know, ionized emission line ratios, they fall in the kind of composite region that's very consistent where, with where local major mergers sit due to shocks. So we can't rule out AGN. In particular, we can't rule out the fact that you know, maybe there was an AGN that turned off. You know, we don't know. That's very hard to rule out. Um, but we certainly don't see any compelling evidence of them. This is going to be the subject of our JWST proposal. Okay, so the previous plot I showed you maybe wasn't the world's most fair comparison because I had, um, you know, shown John's plots in log log space and I showed my previous plot in log linear space. So here's, you know, log stellar mass versus the um, log axis on um, our outflow velocities now. And you can see that, you know, our galaxies are still outliers relative to local galaxies, although it doesn't look quite as dramatic as it did before. 
Um, but it does suggest that maybe, you know, mass is not kind of the fundamental thing that outflows are correlated with. Um, you know, a lot of simulations have chosen to drive outflows where the outflow velocity is correlated with the circular velocity or the escape velocity. But this suggests that, you know, maybe, maybe mass isn't the thing. Maybe there's something else. All right. So here we're looking at star formation, which is another obvious thing that might be um, correlated with outflow, outflow speed. And we're showing um, two different measures of our outflow velocities here. We can look at the kind of average velocity of the line profile, or we can look at the maximum velocity that the profile reaches. And you know, either way we do it, we still see that our galaxies, while they do kind of extend the trends in interesting ways, there are also a subset of them that are outliers from those trends in both the average velocity and the maximum outflow velocity. So it really got us to scratching our heads and trying to think about, you know, what is it about our galaxies that makes them have these really dramatically high, high outflow velocities? It's, you know, it's not their masses, it's not their star formations, what is it? So my prediction was that the important quantity was going to be the star formation rate divided by the stellar mass. But it just turns out that that is completely not a property that outflow velocity correlates with. This is the worst correlation of our entire um, exploration of parameter space. And this has been seen in other samples as well. It's just not a compelling um, axis to look at things along, even though it seems like it should be fairly you know, physically relevant. All right, well, what about star, star formation surface density? There is good reason to think that star formation surface density should be kind of fundamentally linked to outflow velocity, because really, you know, the fundamental unit of all this is the star cluster. And we can think of an individual star cluster having a little, you know, expanding bubble of hot gas, and that bubble is going to expand and blow out of the disk. And if we have a lot of star clusters close together, those bubbles can start working together rather than kind of losing energy and dissipating it into the disk. So when we have um, high star formation surface densities, you know, our prediction is that we would get stronger outflows. And this is seen in simulations that really resolve some of the relevant physics and resolve the relevant spatial scales. So there's beautiful work that just came out from the smog um, simulation group led by Changu Kim. Um, and here we're looking at a plot from their simulations showing star formation surface density on the x-axis and outflow velocity on the y-axis. And um, again, they fit a line to that trend, and we can reproduce that on our, our um, observational plots. OK, so here we're looking at star formation surface density um, for our observed samples of galaxies. Um, versus outflow velocity. And we can see that, you know, it does a not bad job of um, fitting the overall trend. There's a slight kind of zero point offset that probably has to do with how we characterize the outflow velocity itself. Um, but the slope of the correlation is reasonably well reproduced. So I think that's encouraging. It tells us that star formation surface density is an important parameter. Um, but I don't think it, it kind of captures the whole story. For one thing, you know, you can see there's a lot of scatter in this trend. And these, this scatter is not observational error. Um, there's also a fair bit of scatter in the simulations, right? So it tells us there are other important physical um, factors in here. Okay, so going back to our, our first plot here, you know, if we just look at our Isaiah sample and forget the literature samples, we see a huge dynamic range in outflow velocity. And, now, and again, all of these galaxies have kind of comparable masses. All of them are quite compact. So I was trying to think about like, what is the origin of this huge spread in velocity? What could it be? And how do we get gas up to these very, very high velocities? And this comes back to a problem that people have been thinking about for a long time. How do we accelerate cool clouds in a hot wind? So our basic picture has been that, you know, the kind of engine of the galactic wind 
is this hot bubble of gas heated by supernova and shocked stellar winds. And um, this material is flowing out of the galaxy at high velocities, probably something comparable to 3,000 kilometers per second. And that as it's moving out, it's uh, interacting with the ambient gas in the galaxy and kind of entraining that gas and dragging it out with it. And so that's what you see in this kind of cartoon model. And it seems reasonable enough, except that when people started doing detailed simulations of clouds, um, I'm going to play this simulation by um, Evan Schneider. So what we're seeing here is a um, highly structured cloud that's being hit by the ram pressure of a hot wind. So the hot wind is kind of invisible to you, but you see its impact on the cloud. And the problem that these simulations uncovered, I'll play that again. is that it was really hard to accelerate that gas without just completely destroying the cloud. So the clouds tended to get destroyed before they got accelerated. The stuff that survives becomes really compact and dense, and then the ram pressure isn't very effective at pushing on it anymore. OK, so what's the solution to this conundrum? Well, it's been a puzzle for many years, and only in the last few years have we come up with some you know, viable means of um, producing cold gas in a hot outflow. And I think the answer really has to do with radiative cooling. So these are some simulations by Max Gronke. And um, if you look at the left panel, here we have very limited cooling. And the cloud is once again being hit by this hot wind. And in the process, it's being destroyed. You can see a few pieces of the cloud survive, but they don't go anywhere. They're not accelerated. And most of that cloud gets destroyed. Um, what we see in the right-hand panel is a simulation where radiative cooling is turned on. And what's actually happening is the cloud kind of is getting destroyed and mixed in with that hot wind. But the hot wind is usually hot and low density and after it mixes, it has a more sort of intermediate density and temperature. And it hits that part of the cooling curve where it can really effectively cool. So it kind of um, triggers some like runaway radiative cooling in the hot gas. And over time, instead of having that cold gas get destroyed, what we actually see is that cold gas is being born out of the hot wind where it has mixed with some of this entrained material. So this kind of initial mass loading then triggers this massive cooling of the hot phase, which produces more gas. Um, so the really interesting thing about this is that when this gas is kind of reborn from the hot phase, it's reborn with a velocity kind of comparable to the hot wind. And that was what we were seeing in some of our galaxies. OK, well, let's think about that was clouds. Let's think about how this process might um, you know, unfold on kind of galaxy size scales. So this is a cartoon from Todd Thompson um, looking at kind of the same picture where you know, we have an initially hot, fast wind. We have some colder clouds shown in purple that are getting destroyed and mixed into that hot wind. And then at a, the, you know, a certain radius, um, we're going to see this kind of onset of catastrophic cooling, where that cold gas is going to cool out of that hot wind. And um, as that wind becomes more mass loaded, and as it moves further out, it's going to be decelerated. And eventually, it's going to you know, shock with the existing CGM. So the basic thing that I want you to kind of take away from this whole picture is simply that the outflow is probably going to be born fast. It's going to be born at the speed of this hot gas. And that as that hot gas becomes progressively more mass loaded and shocks with the CGM, it's going to slow down. So rather than seeing cold gas that's progressively radially accelerated, we should see gas that starts hot and is decelerated. OK, so is there a way we could look at what happens to this gas over time on galaxy scales? Well, you know, maybe there is. Because fortunately, in addition to this nice magnesium to absorption line, um, we also have that whole beautiful spectrum of the stellar population from you know, near UV wavelengths all the way out to optical wavelengths. 
And we can fit this spectrum with stellar population synthesis models. So this is just one example where we see our spectrum fit by a model that's comprised of um, very young stars. In this case, these stars are between three and seven million years old. So this galaxy is predominantly extremely young. Um, not all of our galaxies are like that, of course. OK, so we're going to use these stellar population models to compute some lightweighted ages for our sample. And when we look at the lightweighted age versus um, outflow velocity, we can actually see that you know, our sample shows a pretty strong and pretty clear trend where the um, you know, galaxies that have the youngest verse have the highest outflow velocities. And these velocities are very comparable to the velocities of that hot wind, which was some 3,000 kilometers per second. Um, and that over time, as the, um, you know, as we look at galaxies that are dominated by older and older stellar populations, we see the outflows moving slower and slower, presumably as they've continued to, you know, entrain mass and decelerate. So there appears to be a real kind of temporal progression here. All right, well, is there any other evidence that, you know, such a thing is happening? Well, yes, a little bit for our sample. Um, so here's that galaxy that I showed you in the beginning named Makani, um, which means wind in Hawaiian. And there was our, there's our O2 image of it. But because KCWI is an IFU, um, we can also look at the velocity at any point in this image. And that's what's shown over here. And uh, there's a lot going on in this figure. Makani is really complicated. The kinematics are complicated. We don't fully understand the velocity projection effects. But if we want to look at this in a very broad brush sense, we would say that there's really two winds in this galaxy. There's a kind of inner, very fast wind. Um, the color coding here is by the blue shift, the maximum blue shift of the line profile. And so this inner wind has a blue shift around 1500 kilometers per second. And then there's a cooler, um, or there's a slower outer wind that has a velocity more like 100 kilometers per second. Um, so I think we're also seeing evidence that, you know, the cooler, the hotter, younger inner wind um, has these higher velocities and that as this material is propagating out to CGM scales, it's slowing down, both because of its mass loading and undoubtedly because it's encountering other material. Um, one curious fact that I'll just throw out there, but I won't spend any uh, real time on is that we also see molecular gas associated with the inner wind. So there's a lot going on in this figure and we'll just, I'll just call your attention to a few things. So we're zooming in on the center of Makani um, and we're gonna pull out a few slices in velocity space. So we can look at the total O2 profile and just select gas at minus 500 to minus 1500. Um, so all of this material should be outflowing. And we can do the same for the CO. And you know, we do see some CO gas with these high negative velocities as well. Um, so it suggests that you know, if this gas is born from cooling out of the hot wind, uh, we have to have pretty extreme cooling in order to create this molecular gas. And I think that's a topic that um, people are thinking hard about, whether that can actually happen. All right, um, so one last word on Makani. When we fit its stellar populations, it decomposes pretty nicely into a you know, young ongoing starburst that you see in blue and a burst that's about 400 million years old. And uh, that's probably consistent, you know, there's our image of the galaxy. It's probably consistent with a burst triggered by the first passage of the galaxies. And then we're, you know, currently witnessing their final coalescence phase. Um, and so we think these inner and outer winds in Makani are associated with these two really distinct starburst events, that bigger one being associated with the burst 400 million years ago. Oops, sorry. All right, so um, let me just wrap up. So I think, um, you know, studying extreme galaxies can be really useful because it can allow us to expand the dynamic range of correlations. And this is critical for providing new benchmarks for simulations. And I was really excited to see Dylan Nelson's um, kind of most recent work 
where he's doing exactly that. So this is a plot from his simulation work where he's comparing the star formation rate and outflow velocity from his simulations. And these colored lines are different ways of characterizing that velocity. Um, if you're measuring the velocity at 99% of the profile or the center of the profile, et cetera. And then he's comparing those velocities with the wide collection of data in the literature, um, which is also measured in kind of, you know, in homogeneous ways. But um, I think it's a very useful comparison. And I think it's really great to see these comparisons being done. And I think by providing more extreme samples of galaxies, we can really extend the dynamic range of this correlation and help, you know, tune our feedback prescriptions to be more realistic. Um, the cold gas in these Hisaia galaxies is really at the extreme of the established trends. And you can see that, in fact, um, it's, you know, for many of these galaxies, they are outliers from known trends, which tells us that maybe these trends really aren't the um, whole story, that there may be, you know, multiple things happening here. And we think that the kind of unique conditions in these compact major mergers are really enabling us to see that gas that has, you know, that cold gas that is maybe just precipitated out of that hot wind. These galaxies are, are so compact that they probably have very kind of delta function, kind of short-lived starbursts. And that enables us to kind of age date them in ways that we couldn't necessarily do with, you know, some sort of typical galaxy that had a much more extended star formation history. And so I think it allows us to see that temporal axis and really look at how that um, gas, how that cold gas gets born fast and slows down over time. Um, okay, let me say one last thing about where I think we're gonna see a lot of progress in the future, and then I will call it good. So for observers, we, we are, you know, the bread and butter of what we do comes down to measuring these absorption line profiles. Um, this is some work from Tim Hackman's group looking at a bunch of UV absorption line profiles. And they have this kind of characteristic shape extending out to large negative velocities. Um, but, you know, it's been really tricky for observers to interpret these line profiles. Things we haven't understood is, you know, is this gas out at high velocity the stuff that's, um, you know, far out in the flow that has been continuously accelerated for a long time? Or is that high gas, um, high velocity stuff, the material that's closer in? Uh, we really haven't known how to understand these line profiles. Simulations, on the other hand, have been great at giving us maps of things like temperature and velocity and mass outflow rate. But we haven't been able to relate those to observations very well until very, very recently. And so I think there's a lot of nice work ongoing by several different groups out there to actually synthesize observational data from these simulations. It's hard because of the spatial scales and because um, you, know, you need to track the various sight lines to the starburst and add all that information up. But there is work um, being done to create these synthetic spectra that I think will be very illuminating both for testing simulations and for helping observers interpret the line profiles that we see. Um, so I think there's a lot of great stuff to come and I will uh, just stop there and take some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Christy. That was an excellent talk. Um, if you have a question, please um, raise your hand now. I might start until people start raising their hands. Um, so concerning the, the scaling relations of the velocities, of the outflow velocities, with, for example, star formation and stellar mass, and you show quite you know, significant scatter with all these properties, I was wondering, if there's any relation um, related to the inclination of galaxies, you know, where you see galaxies basically face on or edge on? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, uh, certainly we see that with local samples where we're looking at disk galaxies. Um, that's been seen with like the sodium measurements that Yan Mei Chen made. Uh, so, inclination matters a lot, and it's just a velocity projection effect. Um, with samples that are mergers, there's been, you know, it's hard to define an inter, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, what the correct inclination is. And we tend to see outflows, you know, rather than being biconical, kind of coming out from all directions. So the covering factor in mergers tends to be more like 80% for outflows. 
Um, with our sample, I was kind of optimistic that we were going to be able to see some trends with inclination. But because our galaxies are so compact and the morphologies are so messed up in most cases, it's been really hard to think about. I think Makani probably is one that's kind of seen edge on, but most of the others, it's it's, it's pretty hard to know. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, I think we have a question, um, Razi. Hi, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so thank you so much for a very wonderful talk. I also have a question regarding to the possible connection to the simulation and the scatter that you mentioned. As it turns out, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that these hot young winds are much faster and they decelerate over the time. So I think if that actually, if that's the reason that sometimes, for example, smoke simulation or others, they may get extra kind of a scatter. Is this any possibility that one could use literally the major trees and actually, you know, track them backward in time just to the time that, for example, for their samplers, that would be also my second question. How we how actually how we are sure that, you know, their sample is just exactly, you know, equivalent to the observation, but let's put it aside for now. So imagine that we use these major trees and then just like follow them back and see those actually beams, you know, whether they were faster before or, you know, what would happen dynamically to them. And something related to that would be also that from the simulation side, it is, it is definitely possible to basically visualize them, you know, in terms of different radius from the center and basically make some kind of, you know, basically visualization on what is the gradient of the velocity of the wind actually, both over the time and also especially. Does that make sense or? Yeah, no, I think that would be kind of fascinating to, to, to see. And, you know, I think the, the big open question that I, you know, I think this age trend is really interesting and intriguing. Um, I don't, I would love to know how that age also corresponds to radius within the galaxy. And so right now, you know, we have Makani where we've been able to look at it in kind of two dimensions um, and actually see that radial information. But we clearly need to build up those samples where we're actually seeing, you know, able to look both observationally and theoretically at what happens to this gas as it propagates out into the flow. Um, most of our galaxies, so we've started building up a sample observed with KCWI. Um, we, it turns out these big nebula are um, like the one we saw around Makani um, seem to be relatively rare. I think in part, we um, didn't know how to select for them when we were doing, you know, we're, we're working on this. This is all stuff that's, that's um, you know, very much in press. But some of the first galaxies we followed up after we found Makani were the ones with the highest outflow velocities. And it turns out most of them have relatively compact nebula. And I think we are seeing this age effect where, you know, there hasn't been time for that stuff to reach large radii yet. Um, so we're starting to focus our follow up more on galaxies like Makani that had this double burst where, you know, maybe there's some outflowing fast stuff now, but there's also been an older population that would have, you know, produced this, this larger flow. Exactly. So can I ask another related question? Sure. So how generic would be having very hot, you know, and very fast young winds, you know, in your galaxies? Is this like, is this very usual to have them or because I, I think that one of the other question would be that what is the mechanism for heating them up so much initially, regardless of, you know, regardless of compactness of your galaxies and so on? Um, so, so, you know, everything we're seeing really is cold gas because everything we're looking at is magnesium too. So what I was trying to indicate with this, you know, V hotline here is simply that, you know, we know from, it turns out modeling the cold gas is hard. Modeling the hot gas isn't quite as hard. Um, we can do some more, you know, um, analytical modeling even that will, you know, tell us about the temperature of the hot gas. And we know that the hot gas is usually moving at velocities of, um, you know, of order 3,000 kilometers per second. So it turns out the velocity of the hot gas is pretty insensitive to um, a lot of different parameters. Um, so the, you know, the interesting thing, though, is just that we can get hold cold gas 
that's kind of moving with similar velocities to the hot gas. And that's the part that's always been problematic because it's hard to accelerate it without destroying it. So I think this idea that maybe it's born directly from the hot gas um, is kind of solving that problem for everyone. So that's what I mean by the be hot here. Not that our gas is hot, just that it's reaching those velocities, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you so much. And we have another question from Igor. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks for a great talk. I have a question whether you, you try to look uh, into another extreme uh, in terms of star formation regime. Uh, there is another subclass of galaxies in SDSS, which are misclassified as quasars, and those are dwarfs pretty nearby with extremely strong and compact star bursts. Uh, one example is Arachelan ARK18. Uh, we recently submitted a paper on it, and there is a star forming clump uh, that looks like uh, it's a, a few tens of parsecs in diameter. And the star formation rate coming out of it is close to one solar mass per year. Well, it's a substantial fraction of one solar mass per year. And we do see some outflow, uh, but uh, so what I'm interested in knowing is that, you know, if you take this uh, star formation surface density, it will be comparable to your extreme examples. But of course, yeah. the global star formation rate is way lower. Mm -hmm. And it seems that the outflow velocities are small. We do see some broad line, uh, some, some broad line component in H alpha and some oxygen in O3 that might be a, an indication of an outflow, but it's like a couple of tens of kilometers per second. So it's pretty normal. So it kind of suggests that the star formation rate, uh, star formation rate surface density is not the regulating factor here. Do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, that's just super interesting. I mean, I think it is really important to expand these samples to, you know, all kinds of galaxies. And I think especially the low mass end is going to be, you know, really super interesting. Um, so yeah, I think it'd be great to see that galaxy on the, you know, star formation surface density plot and, and see where it lies. Um, and, you know, it may well be an outlier. Um, so uh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. the entire galaxy looks pretty normal, but if you take this tiny star forming clump, right it's pretty extreme. It's like a superstar cluster information or, yeah. and it's, it's actually, it's not in the center, it's sort of off center. The galaxy itself looks pretty regularly shaped like an elliptical or bar uh -huh. or whatever with low surface brightness disk. But there is an off centered clump and we suspect that it's a remnant of a merger or like a, an infall of a ma massive gas cloud that happened pretty recently. And the age is also, it's actually, it's also interesting to see in your spectra, you, you're saying that the ages are an order of three to four million years. Uh, do you see any sign, any signatures of um, Wolf Rayet stars, which you would expect? Yeah, so we do. So, you know, not all of my galaxies are like that, right? In the sense of like, this is the light weighted age trend. And you can see, you know, some of them have light weighted ages around 10 million years, but most of them are more in the few hundred million year range. But I did show you that one that was really extreme in blue. And um, that galaxy, you can see this carbon-3 feature over here. And that carbon-3 feature is a wolf ray wind line. And if we zoomed in on that, we'd see there was a little bit of a P-Signy feature. So that, oh, yeah, that you, you can probably see the 4486 a little bit, uh, uh, the helium. Yeah, the problem is our galaxies have such, you know, oh, you're saying, right, the stellar. Yeah, that might well be there as well. Um, yeah, I have to go in and, and look, but yeah. So, so we do think we see, you know, some of these extremely young populations that are, um, you know, also seen often in these dwarf starbursts. But I think dwarf starbursts are great, and we should do, you know, a lot more work to get uh, both ends of this correlation soundly on this plot. So I'm excited to see your work on that. Okay, are there any, are there any last question? I, I have one, but maybe a, a quick, simple one. Uh, this is Randall. Uh, if the clouds are being accelerated and hot and then cooling down radiatively, that implies that the charge distribution inside them, the ionization state, is gonna be set by collisions and recombinations. Uh, whereas normally for CGM models, I see people model the ionization state using cloudy and assuming it's all photoionized of some kind or another. Have you looked into what difference this assumption makes 
in what you see? And is yeah, this I know this is super interesting. And I think I'm not the right person to answer this question just because I haven't worked on it specifically. But Evan Scanapieco has some really nice work working on exactly this, where he's looking at the kind of non-equilibrium chemistry and cooling of this material in outflows, because it turns out that, you know, just assuming everything's in equilibrium and using photoionization is, is not, not right, um, just because we're seeing such a dynamic, quickly evolving mixing medium, right? So, um, so I think that's going to be really important going forward to try to put those things in. Thank you. Great talk. Sorry. Sorry for the background noise here. So I think we reached the top of the hour. So Christy, again, thank you very much for an excellent talk. And everyone else, also thank you for joining today's CFA Colloquium. Have a good evening. Thank you. It was a pleasure.